Welcome to Talk Gnosis, everybody. I'm Father Tony, and uh, to my immediate right, we have. Wait, no, I don't know how. I don't know how screens work. Anyway, we have uh, Jonathan Stewart again to uh, help us out, as usual. Hello, Jonathan. Hello, Father Tony. And as you can see in the middle, we have Greg Kaminsky, host of the Occult of Personality podcast and all around super dude. And uh, we're going to have a conversation about inner alchemy. Uh, which is one of Greg's uh, kind of um, pet topics that he likes to he likes to talk about a lot. So let's start right off. What uh, what is inner alchemy? You know, what's the whole idea of it? Isn't alchemy just turning lead into gold? Well, in a sense, it certainly is. Uh, literally, in uh, medieval alchemists and certainly laboratory alchemists may be attempting to do that, but uh, we. Uh, speculative alchemists, if you will, <clears throat> are more interested in uh, transmuting the, uh, the lid of our experience into a more refined uh, state of consciousness. So our perception is, uh, is more refined and our experience uh, reflects that. So uh, in a sense, um, it's uniting the outer and the inner. It's a process of purification, and it has a long history, not only in Western esotericism, but in the esoteric traditions of other lands as well. Hmm. So, so you just mentioned that this is this is an ancient tradition. It's not something that the 19th century occultists made up by reading old alchemy books and and thinking, taking these metaphors and applying them internally. This there is no, I, I don't. In the West. Yeah, I don't believe it's it's recent. Although, you, you, you know, I, I think you could be forgiven for um, being led to believe that it was maybe rediscovered or recovered uh, by you know certain people in that era. Um, Regardi springs to mind as one of them who might claim to have kind of rediscovered this or Carl Jung for example springs to mind um, there are others before them as well um, I think this is kind of a uh, recurring theme as people read alchemical texts they they have this uh, revelation and they're like you know it it can be a, an overwhelming experience and lead people to believe that you know oh they've figured it all out um, which is mm -hmm. which is typical of the mystical experience because um, generally um, unless you've got someone who's guiding you it's easy to believe that like ah ha, ha, I've had the experience and now this is this is it I finally reached the top of the pyramid of course you know it's always just a step along the path inevitably so yeah, yeah but I think it is ancient um, there's evidence evidence for what I would call a, a primordial tradition of using breath, meditation, um, chanting of some sort, um, focusing the mind um, into the physical being and um, using these, these things to sort of transform consciousness. And, and by doing that, it ultimately is transforming the, the physiology, the blood chemistry, um, and the uh, the effects can be profound, but uh, only if you actually devote yourself to it um, at length. So it does require extreme investment, um, you know. But the payoff is what I would consider pretty large as well. So, so we're talking about actual transmutation here, like actual physical changes that come about as a result of these inner alchemy practices. Well, it's hard to say. I mean, physical changes, um, I would say yes, but, you know, are they measurable? Um, how would you compare yourself, you know, hmm. at, to, you know, in the future, if you had done these practices, how do you compare yourself to not having done them? I mean, it's, it's hard to say, you know. Um, I think the benefits are tangible. I think if people, anybody who does the practices regularly over an extended period of time, I think would have some benefit from it. Your mileage may vary, but it's going to produce effects inevitably. Um, and I think that is uh, really 
you know, any kind of esoteric practice, if the person's really earnest about it, if they really go into it, they're going to get results. That's just the way it works. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I, I concur. Now, is this just one practice, or is it a variety of practices, or is it a family of practices, or is there just one thing you do in inner alchemy? Well, I mentioned you can use a variety of different techniques, and, and I like to employ a variety of techniques, you know, meditation, ritual, um, talismans, symbolism, uh, breathing techniques, chanting. I mean, all of these things are really good. Um, physical exercise can also be a factor as well. Um, things like, you know, asana yoga or um, tai chi if they're done, you know, with the breath and in the proper intention, they could also be like aspects of this kind of a practice because, you know, anything that is involved in purifying the body and purifying the mind with a spiritual intent can be put to this, this practice. So the more you do, the better, you know, the, but at, at the same time, you know, uh, everyone's capacity for purification is different. Hmm. Yeah. Um, so, um, when you are doing these practices and doing these different spiritual exercises, what kinds of um, what kinds of effects do you notice? So, you know, how do you know if the does that burning sensation means that the practice is working? <laughs> yeah. So one thing I think you know, there's a variety of like different levels. Um, and I think the basic level would be things you would notice like improved digestion, improved sleep, um, more focused attention for longer periods of time, uh, improved visualization skills. And then there's, uh, I think, like another tier above that, which is um, where you start noticing more of the physiological changes where your um, mood is you know noticeably different for longer periods of time um and then i think there's a something that i would call like a um a gnostic intoxication that can occur and this can manifest in different ways in different people because it's an aspect of the inner fire itself so um but generally uh it's very pleasurable, uh, it's intense, um, it can be disorienting at times, but not in a bad way. Um, I think another big noticeable effect is uh, improved health benefits. Um, you Working with this practice has a way of, I would say, transmuting um, health issues um, obviously, the the more mundane the issue, the easier it is to work with. So, you know, if you're if you have a cold, you can kind of work through it more quickly. Chronic health issues obviously take a longer amount of time. Um, and then, you know, beyond that, there's the the mystical experiences, which what I would describe as to me, they're they're gnostic experiences, and I and I would define that as a uh, an experience of the uh, breakdown of the subject object polarity. So there's no difference between the seer and what is seen, and um, and the, that to me would be one of the sort of penultimate type of uh, levels of experience. Of, that you could expect from this type of practice. <laughs> well, that sounds pretty grand. Right? <laughs> that sounds good to me. <laughs> but I mean, that's that's generally the goal of mysticism. Generally, so this is just another example of mystical practice. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt, but we need your help. Talk Gnosis and all of the shows on the Gnostic Wisdom Network are free and will always be free, but it does cost us a lot of time and money to actually make these shows. So 
What I'd like to ask is that if you have enjoyed our programming, if you've found something useful uh, about it, if you've been educated, please consider becoming a patron over on our Patreon campaign at patreon.com slash Gnostic. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash Gnostic. We've got a whole bunch of new shows that we'd like to start making, but we can't do it until we can start to support ourselves a little bit more financially. And um, we really hope that you will assist us in our goals. Uh, we've got a great show coming up about sex and spirituality with uh, Reverend Mr. Jonathan Stewart from Talk Gnosis and his wife, Sarah Beale. Uh, we've got The Lost Word coming back, Esoteric Freemasonry and Fraternal Orders and initiate, Initiatory Orders and all that kind of thing. We've got Temples and Tentacles uh, with some weird fiction authors, kind of Lovecraftian spirituality stuff that I think you're really going to like. Plus some really interesting kind of fictional and um, uh, kind of entertainment based things that we want to do that also have kind of an esoteric and Gnostic educational component. So please. Uh, we need your help to make all of this possible. We have big dreams, but we don't have a lot of resources to make those dreams a reality. So please do visit patreon.com slash Gnostic if you haven't already and uh, pledge. You just give a small amount of money uh, for every educational media thing that we put out. And then at the end of the month, your, your card gets charged. You can set an upper limit so that you're, ne you're never surprised by uh, too many things getting charged on your card per month. It's really very easy and very painless, and it makes a huge difference to the Gnostic Educational Ministry of the Gnostic Wisdom Network, the Apostolic Joe and I Church, and all of us here who work so hard to bring you this, um, what we think anyway, is pretty great content. So if you agree, that's patreon.com slash Gnostic. Sorry again for the interruption, and back to the show. for myself and, and for the listeners like this, this all sounds very interesting but when we when we're kind of thinking about tying it in with with alchemy with these people working in the labs and with this this very strong alchemical symbolism that, that we see you know if we open up those those reprints of the old alchemy texts they have these mysterious symbols um how, how does this exactly tie in with with these practices with these meditations with this breath do you, do you use some of that symbolism? Is it just is it just the idea that you're transforming, you know, a lower state to a higher state? If you can just help me, like, understand, connect these these kind of two these kind of these two things. Sure. So there's um, there's different levels where they're connected. So I, one of them would be in a in a historical context. So not just in the West, but also in other cultures, um, alchemy generally begins or began i should say as a way to like you mentioned to transmute metals to change states uh, to purify change lead into gold ideally but that wasn't the only transformation they were going after um, but generally what happened at some point along the way is that enough people were unsuccessful in this process that they abandon it and it becomes seen as a metaphor for an inner process, right? And this is like what is, I would say is a middle stage. And I'm taking this more from the Arabic um, alchemy because in, in Arabic history, the, the alchemical stages are much more well-defined than they are in the West. So you can see this transition much more sharply. So after this sort of theosophical, inner, spiritual, alchemical stage, um, it morphs into a more practical uh, laboratory alchemy that's infused with spiritual intention, but the goal is not transmutation so much as it is to produce alchemical medicines. Mm. Because this is the stage where they can actually produce things that they can hand to somebody and they can ingest it and it actually produces a real result and this is obviously the forerunner of chemistry and part of of medical the history of medicine that was developing in Arabic lands. so it's easier to kind of see these connections in other cultures history than it is in the West because it occurred so much later and the Western culture was a, a lot more deprived 
during the Middle Ages than in other parts of the world. So I think that's why our alchemical history is a lot more murky than it was in these other places where it's much more defined and alchemy is not seen as some sort of quackery because it actually did produce results um, even as it did in the West, um, but it, it was, I think, just much more just culturally um, accepted. So um, I think that's one aspect where you get the, uh, the alchemical connections between the lab alchemy and the inner alchemy. Um, another is the symbolism. Jung is the best example of this, where he's, you know, translating psychological phenomena in terms of alchemical symbolism and artwork. Um, the Red Book is a great example of this, where he's producing his own alchemical art, I would say, or Gnostic art, esoteric art, symbolic art. Um, so it's, it's sort of uh, using symbolism to describe states, experiences, processes that defy language, that defy description. Um, even the symbols really aren't sufficient to communicate what's happening, but they do it better than just about anything else can. So the third sort of way that these things are connected is, as you mentioned, in using the, uh, the analogy of alchemy, the purification, the states or stages of alchemy for the processes of the practice. And the other way would be to relate the symbolism of the actual lab equipment to the body itself um, in different ways. The athenor as, you know, the sort of like the lungs and the gut, like the general trunk of your body. The bellows, kind of like your diaphragm pumping the air into the athenor to fan the flames. Um, you know, and then you have the alembic, you know, above that getting heated, um, circulating the vapors and and um, raising the light, essentially. So there's different ways these things are connected. Um, so it, it may seem tenuous uh, on, a, on a superficial level, but if you dig deeper, these connections are really, really strong. Um, they're inseparable. I was having a conversation uh, just the other night. Um, there are a lot of um, esoteric kind of death and rebirth rituals, initiation rituals that yeah. are entirely alchemical. You know, um, in one in particular that I, I won't say too much about, um, that uh, the the um, the initiate is is uh, buried three times, buried and, and raised three times, and that to me is an indication that that's an alchemical symbol that you know you have this um, kind of circulation happening of the material you know the whatever it is you're working on in this case it's the the soul or the spirit or whatever you you know you want term you want to use for it that mm -hmm. is buried some decomposition happens to it it's raised up it's purified it's buried again and so on and so forth and kind of this cyclical alchemical purification solve et coagula process That's so right. it's not just a question of applying the alchemical symbols to the body but also putting the body in the place of the alchemical material at the that's same a good point yeah that's a great point absolutely yeah. Certainly, I think uh, there's many uh, initiatory situations where you could probably draw these analogies as well. Um, and and it, I think on, on a, some essential level, it points to the fact that the processes of laboratory alchemy, the processes of initiation and mystic, mystical practice are doing the exact same thing in different contexts mm -hmm. but the process is exactly the same right and that's why it the laboratory alchemy i'm told is such a good teacher you know for this whole process because you know it's like nature itself is guiding you through how it works rather than 
sort of like having to go within and and uncover it on your own you've also got a uh, an external example in front of your eyes although certainly not required i mean there's mm -hmm. many people throughout history who have gone on this journey without you know flasks and vessels and and different substances you know so that i think that's what's what I think is really uh, beautiful about this whole tradition is that um, it is alchemical, but you don't have to have the outer laboratory work in order to participate in it. Mm. Speaking right. of not having that work, um, you mentioned that the there was a lot of um, uh, practical kind of medicinal stuff that came out of alchemy particularly in in the arab world um it's uh is, is a lot of that still in practice today or, or has that kind of been uh, been lost i think it, a lot of it is still in practice today um even in the west i think there's a lot of contributions towards that um, paracelsus name comes up prominently um, some of his developments, I think, are still in practice. I could be mistaken, but I, I think he was the one who sort of came up with the concept of the pill mm. itself. Mm. Um, and I could be mistaken, but I feel like a lot of his uh, ideas and practices, which may not have been truly original to him, still are around um, the idea of like a system of correspondences um, you know natural correspondences and how that works I, you know that I think although not widely accepted anymore is still in use in certain places um, you know and I think um, certainly the ideas of like herbalism you know using plants as medicines is very popular uh, metals less so, um, but you know those are clearly much more dangerous to work with. And from what I've heard, the experiences they bring about are also more challenging as well. So, um, but the the benefits from working with plants as medicines are tremendous, and I think um, we overlook them at our peril. Hmm. Yeah, and and of course that's something that's basically mainstream now, right? Is is uh, you can go into a any drugstore and they're going to have a very large herbal section. Um, and there's actually, uh, my wife uh, takes a lot of supplements and she has, uh, I was just reading, I don't know, I was bored. Okay, folks, I'll confess, I know this is live, but I was in the washroom, did not have my phone or anything to read, <laughs> so kind of reading some bottles. And one of the supplements she takes, it's a Canadian company, its name escapes me at the moment, but it's quite popular, it's one of the larger herbal um, um, uh, sellers and they actually sell their stuff as a tincture. Oh, here it is. It's called uh, Botanica, mm -hmm. and uh, they actually say on the side that they they uh, all their dis distillations are made in a tr traditional alchemical way. So they actually combine the, the salts of the plant in with the supplements as well. So I'm like, oh, and you know, this is sold, and their products are sold in in every corner drugstore and every uh, um, every uh, health food store in Canada. So I'm like, okay, that that's a very literal use of this this ancient knowledge. So that was just my diversion of kind of a gross story in the middle. But uh, I'd like to go back a little bit. You know, something that Father Tony touched on, uh, uh, kind of threes. There's, there's traditionally three stages in alchemy, and, and you go through these these three stages in, in with the inner alchemy as well? Generally, yeah. Generally. I mean, there's sometimes you could divide it up maybe into four, but three is good, I think. You know, the black, the red, the white phase... Um, are generally, I think, um, good ways of dividing it up because uh, it, it's easy to perceive the differences because uh, it's unmistakable as you're doing the practice. The black phase, uh, negredo, uh, generally associated with like the phases of putrefaction and alchemy, um, kind of like going within the earth. Um, the death phase, if you will, um, fighting the dragon. Um, so this generally brings about um, feelings of, of uh, depression, anxiety, um, isolation, um, you know, 
feelings of great unease about yourself, about the world, um, how the two fit together, maybe. So it's a it's a real like night of the soul type of phase. Um, so it's really unmistakable. And then once you go through that, you kind of can get into um, the more um, elevated states, I think I would describe them as um, generally uh, the white phase, uh, a lot of times associated with uh, devotion. Um, and this, this, you know, depending on how things work in the inner these are not really uh, always going to be in any specific order. Um, generally, the black phase will come first, um, but you know the other two. I've, I've had experiences myself where it's been uh, one or the other. Um, you know, generally one is more about um, working in the world, working in the body, being conscious of the breath. Uh, the energy feeling very strong and vital, you know, this is the red phase. And then you have the white phase, which is much more devotional, uh, much more feeling um, connected with whatever you want to put it. Um, but it, it's much more uh, of like a closer to those mystical states where the, uh, the polarities start to break down a little bit more. So, um, so those those aspects of a consciousness are very much um, part of, of the alchemical practice, and certainly for this inner inner practice when you're working with this energy, um, it brings about a lot of different feelings, thoughts, emotions, and the goal is really to work through them and not to to get stuck in any one of these phases because it's a process and it's ongoing you it's never ending you know it's the great work because it doesn't ever stop yeah um I, you kind of answered my next question uh because you're talking about in, in that black phase right uh you're working with uh so a lot of negativity comes up but you you kind of deliberately make use of negativity this might just be me maybe it's human experience hopefully it is but i often find what we think of as negative emotions to be much more powerful i mean in, in the short term hopefully not in the long term hopefully love is the most powerful of them all but in the short term it sure feels like anger and depression and wrath and sadness seem to have a real emotional energy they really kind of fire up the brain there's, there's an almost literal energy you can feel through your body when you're really angry do you do you use these negative emotions do you do you use these um these uh the energies that these emotions uh, evoke at all in inner alchemy or is it just something that you work through in the black phase well i would say um using the energy i would say it, that is what happens, but it's not really uh, like consciously employing it. I think it's more being aware of how you're feeling, um, not distracting yourself from it, really experiencing it in all its, you know, gory detail, and not, you know, running from it. Just totally diving into the experience, and then um, what happens is that. Uh, Essentially, it empowers the practitioner to just go further in in the other phases as they develop. Because um, there's many reasons for this. I think you know um, one of which is uh, it's I think partly fundamental recognition that uh, the human experience, no matter uh, how good it is. Um, it's you know there's always something lacking and there's always a need for more um, the, the the feeling of completion is is really rare um, that we certainly want it for it to last in any sense so there's this constant sort of nagging um, you know displeasure or you know Buddhists refer to this like suffering um, but it's a general 
lack of satisfaction with the way things are. You know, it's it generally I like to boil it down to like there's the re- way things are and the way you want it to be, and the two generally don't are not in congruence. So that black phase is representative of all of this, and it it's important to really like you said kind of ride that wave because uh this is this is the whole reason for for all of this these practices is to change to transmute consciousness so that we're able to recognize that um, life as it is is you know certainly sufficient and it you know in all its glory heaven on earth paradise now you know all of these promises of the sages and mystics you know can be ours if we're able to change our perspective enough and you know unless you're lucky to have that lightning flash experience of grace um, this is sort of one avenue to try to get to get there because the this is open to anybody at any time you know the these avenues that I'm talking about anybody anytime anywhere can do this yeah, it's just right. that simple. <laughs> <laughs> well, that that is refreshing and nice to hear. Actually, that it is it, it is a practice that's open to to everyone. Uh, we'll start wrapping up soon, but just again, kind of talking about alchemy and in general and, and these practices in specific to sort of clarify, you know, some of the language and and again, it's stuff you've already touched on, but for my own understanding and. For the watchers and the and the uh, the listeners. Also, I don't know how. Uh, I have a funny story that I'll. I will tell Father Tony later, but I ask a lot of leading questions, and then some people have been think I'm dumb. I have gotten that feedback. <laughs> They're like, "You don't know about any of this stuff." Uh, but you know, sometimes it's called interviewing. So, That's how it works. It is called interviewing. That's right. It's yeah. a skill. <laughs> but um, so is alchemy. Is it changing one thing to another? You know, where, again, where I think about that that stereotype, that cliche. You have lead. It's totally different from gold. You're changing the lead into the gold. Or are you? Are you uncovering a purity that's already there, or are you are you kind of combining two things that are really opposite to make something new? Like, which is which is the best metaphor or way to think of it, or is it all of the above? Or <laughs> yeah, I would all, say all all of the above is really the most apt answer, uh, the best answer to your question, because alchemy does involve all of these things. It involves a transformation of consciousness. It achieves this through a process of purification, of transmuting one thing of a grosser state into another through purifying and removing the impurities. Um, And by doing that, uh, consciousness, uh, I would guess you would say, is restored or you maybe remember a state that's more pure, which is essentially the breakdown of the subject-object polarity, the union of opposites. So, yes, it's all of these things. They're all aspects of the alchemical work, absolutely. Very all cool. Right. Very cool. Well, so, I think that's the, yeah. all the time that we're going to have for this one. Uh, I know we could... We could talk forever about this. And we we could have. Talk forever. Yeah. Um, I really appreciate the time. Thank you so much, guys. No, thank you very no, much for uh, for jumping in here last minute, and, uh, helping us uh, helping us fill our little bye week here. Um, so tell uh, tell our viewers and listeners um, they'd like to start in on some inner alchemy practices. What what would you recommend? Where should somebody start? Um, I think there's a few avenues um there's a few books available um that you could begin with um david goddard's uh the tower of alchemy is probably a really good if you wanted to learn the theory and practice of it that's probably a single source that that you could go to um i have a number of recordings in the occult of personality membership section that detail the theory and beginning practice behind this as as I've taught it to people and as I do it and I've done it for more than a decade and I think um, there's a a few other books that would give you some really good background information on this including um, the work of David Chaim Smith Um, and I mention him specifically because I'm working on, on editing his upcoming book which is titled uh, Deep Principles of Kabbalistic Alchemy, Volume 1, 
and so he's he's going along the very same lines um, that I'm talking about. Um, so, you know, I'll probably be talking more about that book in the future. But um, his work uh, is generally along these lines as well: uh, mystical practice and using symbolism, and uh, the Kabbalah, and um, it's generally. It's along the lines of the things I'm interested in as well. Um, there's also books by Paul Foster Case on esoteric keys of alchemy, uh, Israel Regardi, The Philosopher's Stone. Uh, there's many, many others. Um, people can contact me directly either by email, occultapersonality at gmail.com or via the website, occultapersonality.net or Facebook or Twitter. Just get in touch and I'm happy to talk about this. All right. That's terrific. Thank you again. And uh, it is always a pleasure to talk to you. And I hope that we will meet again very soon. Absolutely. Same here. Be well. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Good night. Bye.